Ruchi Sharma, welcome to the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, I think that anyone that's watching this show is probably wondering what a top global investor and author is doing on a show with a film critic, but that is exactly what makes it so exciting and interesting for me. Um, Ruchir, we know you, of course, as an investor. We know you uh, as a strategist. Uh, we know you as the author of three very successful books on emerging markets, global economy, um, and, of course, on your experiences tracking um, the Indian elections. Um, what I'm guessing a lot of people may not know is about your passion for the movies, and that's what um, we're here to talk about today, aren't we? Yes, Rajiv. I'm so glad that we're doing this show because I've also watched your work over the years, and as a film buff... Uh, always follow it in terms of what you've had to recommend. Uh, but the connection is not as, uh, you know, sort of disparate as it uh, appears, because uh, as a global investor, I've traveled to many countries. And this passion for cinema, for foreign cinema in particular, really comes from that, uh, because it gives me a chance to immerse into different cultures, to know what's happening in these different cult uh, countries, to get a flavor of their history. And so that's why it's a weekend routine for me in New York, uh, where I've been now for nearly 20 years, that every weekend I have to see at least one foreign film. And I've tried to do that for all the weekends that I've been in New York for the last 20 years. Wow. You know, um, I, I saw this piece that you wrote, and I'm guessing that that comes from this habit, from this practice that you put in place. Um, this piece that you wrote recommending 20 foreign films that one must watch during quarantine. And, you know, I, I have to say it's an incredible list. It's got some great choices, including some of my favorites. I saw the French film um, Elle starring Isabelle Huppert on that, on that list, which is an incredible um, film. I saw A Separation, which everyone loves, of course, the Iranian film, um, the Argentinian film The Secret in Their Eyes. I want to ask you, Ruchir, can you talk about um, the joy of discovery? You know, you said, uh, you said you've spent, um, you know, practically every weekend watching at least one foreign film. The joy of discovering something new, because, um, you know, sitting in New York, I'm guessing you're watching these films when they're coming out, when they're, when they're coming out to an American audience, to a global audience. You also told me earlier that um, you've traveled to film festivals and that's where you discovered a lot of these films. Also, you discovered some of them in their native countries. So can you talk about that joy? joy of discovery, you know, discovering something unexpected and new. Yeah, that's how really my journey started as far as foreign films was concerned. I moved to New York uh, at the end of 2002 and early 2003. And if you recall, Raji, what was happening then was uh, something quite significant, which is in Hollywood, they were giving up making these kind of slice of life films. The focus in Hollywood was turning very much to the big budget tentpole kind of movies at one end, and at the other end you had these small budget indie films. But these sort of mid-budget movies, uh, which is what we grew up on in the 1980s and 1990s, Hollywood really uh, abandoned that space. And at the same time I moved to New York, mm. um, and there was a cinema hall right next to my apartment in New York called the Lincoln Plaza Cinema. This is a multiplex. You'd sort of go into this right. underground. It's on 63rd in Columbus back in New York. And they would curate and show around five movies a week in a multiplex chosen from different parts of the world usually. And that is what was my introduction mm. uh, into foreign cinema. Because I grew up in India. And in India, of course, the taste was cultivated watching mm. all the Bollywood stuff. Uh, and also the Hollywood movies that we would see on DVDs or VCRs before that. But this transition to watching global cinema, foreign cinema from different countries, from France to Korea, that really began in around 2003 after I shifted to New York. And I, this uh, amazing multiplex I discovered close to my home where you could sort of go and you did not know as to what sort of movies were going to be shown. On, and you didn't even read much about it because these movies weren't covered that widely in the press. And just the joy of discovering, being right. transported to these different cultures, these different countries. And that's what came back to me in this period of the lockdown, that a lot of friends of mine who knew I had an interest in this, stuck at home, sort of told me that, why don't you come up with this list of all these movies that you have seen, so sitting home we can travel the world and um, witness these different cultures and different countries. 
you know what I what I think is great is that your choices are so eclectic you know so while you choose something as as stark and as political as the Russian film Leviathan um, you're also clearly drawn to you know dare I say more popular choices you know films like um, the Argentinian film Wild Tales which is just such a fun film or um, you know or even something like the Intouchables the French film um, or even the Swedish trilogy you know the Millennium uh, trilogy uh, based on Stieg Larsson's books um, I love the way you sort of describe some of these films I love the way that you described Victoria which is of course the German film um, which is shot to look like one take I love how you describe it you you've said um, for edge of the seat drama nothing in my experience has topped Victoria before or since um, I love how you describe one of the most talked about moments in that German comedy uh, Tony Erdman you said uh, it's the most excruciatingly funny nude scene of all time so I really I, you you do have very eclectic tastes don't you yeah I think Rajiv it's about the joy of cinema one problem I do have with critics in general and this is why I sort of came up with this list is that sometimes when you're a critic I think the tendency is to focus too much on uh, you know some of the very subtle and some of the very uh, complex issues in films and there's a tendency I find sometimes of critics to want to focus on the dark side of uh, cinema because almost as if if you have too much fun in a movie it's not supposed to be a good movie when's the last time a comedy won an oscar uh, for example it's supposed to be a bit uh, you know considered like a bit shallow so my sort of uh, job here in a way was to come up with a list which was much more accessible uh, and something that you would enjoy bring a smile to your face now of course that's not always the case there's some pretty serious cinema also out there uh, but it's about right. being creative you mentioned about L um, you know the French film from 2016 now that de deal with such a difficult subject of rape and yet it's handled in a, a very creative way and you never you know like feel so sorry for the victim because you know that Isabel Huppert is not a person that you mess with even on screen so I think that's what uh, right. draws me to this kind of cinema which is like you can you can also uh, enjoy it you can get a taste for various cultures and you don't have to be bogged down by thinking about the dark side of cinema because some of the films that I think that critics are often drawn to tend to be quite dark right uh, that is that is true, um, but I uh, but I you know but I do actually feel that that critics do um, you know I think now that uh, now that the world is becoming a smaller place in a sense, and now that there is so much more access and why this list is great is because also um, today with all the streaming platforms one can actually watch a lot of these films sitting at home. But I want to ask you um, I want to ask you Ruchir for someone that counts film as one of your great passions, um, is there a film that changed your life? Um, you know was there a film that perhaps made you look at the world very differently you know has has one film um, been a sort of turning point in your life yeah I go back to my days of watching movies at Lincoln uh, cinema and I think that back in 2003 there was this French movie which came out uh, around there called look at me uh, you know like it wasn't a, it wasn't one of the greatest French films but for me it was a turning point because it was such a good slice of life films and when I watched that film at the same time that I was starring on Hollywood, I think that film was what is called a gestalt shift. That you just saw the world differently after that, uh, the world of cinema. I think that that movie I would put at that. So it's a very personal choice, but for me, I think it's about these slice of life films, films that feel very authentic. Uh, and that movie was like a turning point that once I saw that, and then there were a series of French movies I saw after that. You remember in 2005, there was this incredibly exhilarating French film called uh, The Beat That My Heart Skipped. Uh, it, it possibly had one, the best yes. soundtrack that any movie has ever had uh, uh, in, that, in that time. So I think that it's a bunch of films came out at that point in time which really resonated with me. Uh, so I, I look back at a film like Look At Me and say that that was possibly a turning point for me but that may have been very personal as far as I'm concerned but as you know my interest in cinema sure. predates that it just is the interest in foreign cinema in global cinema uh, that's where it began you know, the, so this confluence of events I go to New York Hollywood vacates the space of making you know, the slice of life films my interest in foreign travel given my job as a global investor and in traveling to various emerging markets 
that is what sort of takes me to different countries, and I still want to come back to New York and be immersed in those different cultures. You know, it's so interesting that so many of the films that you've actually listed in that um, in that list went on to be remade by Hollywood, actually. You know, they're great foreign films, great foreign language films. Um, you know, the Millennium Trilogy, of course, Intouchables. A bunch of them actually were, were remade in, in the popular Hollywood format. But, um, but, but Richard, for anyone that thinks that your love for film is limited only to foreign, um, foreign films, we should mention here that you're as much of a, uh, of a Bollywood nut and, uh, and a lover of, of Indian cinema, aren't you? You told me earlier that um, you, you were first exposed to films actually um, as a young boy growing up in, uh, in, in Bijnur in Uttar Pradesh. And um, actually, you should tell the story. It's a lovely story about <laughs> your grandfather, and, and I want you to narrate that. Yeah, I wrote about this in my third book, in fact, Democracy on the Road, as to how my interest in both India and Indian politics was cultivated by my summer vacations that I spent uh, in my mother's hometown of Bijnor. Um, this was back in the uh, 1980s. Unlike the kids today watching this show, where they can tell their parents which place in the world they want to go to for summer, in that time, we didn't really have a choice. We were told every summer that we're going to go to our... Uh, 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 grandparents' place, whether it's our, my father or my mother's place. So typically it would be split a month each in Bijnor, uh, which is uh, in western UP, and in Jaipur, where my father comes from. But it's my stays in Bijnor which mm. um, have remained with me long since then. Um, as I mentioned in the book, too, that the defining quality of that place was really nothing to do. That's even the title of the chapter uh, on Bijnor. But coming back to cinema, here's what would happen. So we'd go there as kids, and the electricity would go off so often in the afternoon or in the evening. Uh, in fact, those days, the number of hours you'd have electricity was uh, uh, less than the number of hours you would not have electricity. So one of the escapes that my grandfather had was to take us to the cinema hall, which those days had generators and they uh, had some air conditioning going. So we'd go to the cinema hall, and those days there was no political correctness. So we'd go to these cinema halls and watch all kinds of movies, which today I think that young kids would never be taken to watch. Uh, and of course, there were some fun movies we watched. Uh, from movies like Love Story, I remember back in the early 1980s, but I also remember movies like Insaf Ka Tarazu. Uh, that's a movie again dealing with rape. And I think that as a, you know, maybe I was five or six years old to be taken to a cinema and to watch that, but to also see the passion that people had, the dancing in the aisles, the coin throwing that would go on in, uh, in those days. Mm. There was something very amusing about that as kids to watch that. And I think that that's really what. Uh, cultivated my taste for uh, cinema. And also growing up in a place like Bijnor had me really attracted to watching slice of life films and watching cinema, which was very rooted in the hinterland, particularly uh, in India. So I love watching movies and even of late serials in India that are so rooted in the hinterland. Uh, and uh, Bijnor and my growing up there and spending my summer vacations there is responsible for that. You know, you described what, what could easily be a scene straight out of a film like Cinema Paradiso. Um, but, but Richard, you've also said um, that for, of course, you know, and, and this, is, this is well known, that for, for over 20 years, you've been making these election trips across India where you lead a group of 20 writers, 20 journalists uh, across the country during every election year um, to understand what India wants, what India is thinking, um, you know, just leading up to the elections. Of course, your findings, your experiences on these, on these election trips have, um, have, have been wonderfully articulated in your book, Democracy on the Road, which came out last year, uh, but you've said that your travels through the hinterland, visiting places uh, that have been the setting of some popular Hindi films, have also given you an insight into popular Hindi cinema of the 2000s, haven't they? Yeah, because in these places that we go to, as you know, that uh, the um, setting is something which feels so uh, out of a Bollywood movie. Now, in 2005, we were traveling uh, in... Uh, the district of Champaran uh, in Bihar. And that was quite an experience mm. even to get there. But in places like those are almost defined by directors such as Prakash Jha, that they come from those uh, areas. And you just can't help but having a conversation about 
film and how it was shot there because it's such a big thing when those movies are shot in those areas. So I remember this movie in 2005 came out called Abharan. Uh, and that was uh, shot right there right. Uh, in those areas. And Prakash Jha is such a legend in uh, a place like Bihar. So that's something which sort of, you know, stayed in my head. Then after that, I remember watching Omkara in 2006, which I ranked as one of my favorite Hindi movies of all time. Uh, because it felt so authentic. The story was great, it felt so authentic, and it was shot in Western UP, which is very much where um, Bijnor is. And it was followed up by you know, movies like Ishkia, shot in Eastern UP. Now, these are places that we have actually traveled to. I've had the opportunity like, to travel to, go to places like Betia, near uh, Champaran in uh, North Bihar, growing up in Bijnor, going for election trips to Eastern UP, places like Mirzapur, and then being able to cross-reference in terms of what is shown uh, on the screen mm -hmm. and what we actually experience when we are there. And it, it's such an integral part of the local culture, these conversations about cinema. Okay, Ruchir, you've, you've spoken about the influence that the movies had growing up. So let me put you on the spot. Um, give me your list of five favorite Hindi films of all time. Yeah, that's a tough one given the number of Hindi films that we have seen. But I'd say that it possibly goes back to the early 1980s. I, uh, my favorite Hindi movie comedy of all time has to be Jane Bido Yaro. I think it was uh, really smart and witty, and I showed it to my nephews the other day, and they were also as delirious as I was when I was watching it. Um, apart from that, in terms of authenticity, I would say Omkara and Ishkia uh, were two movies that I enjoyed a lot uh, from a purely authentic standpoint. Um, as a love story, I would possibly say Silsila, Again, a movie that I saw possibly uh, far too early, but it left an impression, and, I, and uh, it was so spectacularly short, uh, and um, a movie well uh, um, ahead of its time, but still uh, very relevant. And the last one is more of a provocative choice. It's Karan Johar's Kabi Alveda Na Kena. And that may be because I don't think any director has shot New York so beautifully as Karan has. Uh, it was. Uh, just so well done, and the story also was uh, something which was a bit different. Um, and the entire movie was shot, not the entire movie, but large uh, segments of the movie were shot right outside my home in Central Park. Uh, and uh, you know, there was a recent feature in the New York Times where they were talking about all the great movies that have been shot in New York. And I wish they had also included this movie because uh, I think that it was uh, really well shot by Karan. So much of popular entertainment in Hindi cinema and now on the OTT space, you know, you mentioned Mirzapur, um, also, of course, you know, Vishal Bhardwaj's films, which really smell of the soil of those places. Um, you know, so much of, of that is um, now rooted in the hinterland and, and the emphasis is on authenticity and on texture and on being um, real to the worlds that they're set in. Um, you know, from your experiences, I mean, you told me, uh, you told me when we were speaking yesterday that Pan Singh Tomar, um, you know, you visited Chambal and, and and, you know, and, and that's where, of course, Pan Singh Tomar was shot, and that's where Bandit Queen was shot back in the day, and Son Chiria has been shot. Um, you know, can you talk about that, you, you know, why authenticity is what's, what's sort of key? You know, I've seen it from, a, from, the, from the perspective of a film critic, but as someone who loves the movies as a viewer, is that what draws you in, the fact that you know that this is authentic? It almost smells, I mean, the best films are the ones that transport you to a new world, don't they? Yeah, so I think that uh, I've been to these areas, as you, as you mentioned, and in Chambal, we have met some of these dacoits, in fact. Now, the reality is a lot more prosaic than what is projected on the screen. You go to Mirzapur, it just feels like this dilapidated, typical Indian town where the clock tower is there, and the, but the clock has no hands. Uh, so it's, it's a lot more prosaic. It's not the kind of scene which is depicted out there, but still, the look and feel of the place, I think now, has become much more authentic uh, on screen in Indian cinema. There's a lot more attention being paid to small details, uh, uh, small dialogues which are there in these films that come through. And so I think that's, uh, it's that kind of cinema that I'm so happy is emerging in India and also being shown on these OTT platforms. So as I said, that whether it was uh, Northern Bihar, the Chambal district, in UP, in all these places now, uh, I'm so happy that you have directors who come from these places and are able to bring that authentic 
uh, yeah. feel uh, to the screen. Having said that, I'm still a bit disappointed that India hasn't made the full sort of transition. You know, like another piece that I'd written earlier this year was the fact that I was, uh, when Parasite won uh, the Oscar and um, it sort of made records of being the first foreign film to win the Best Picture award, I was just so disappointed to see that why an Indian film in over uh, you know 50, 60 years that we've been sending our nominations up uh, for e even the best foreign film uh, hasn't won a single award as yet in that category. And even in the film festival circuit, which I like going to, whether it's in Berlin, Venice, uh, or at uh, Cannes, we always come up short. So that is something which is still disappointing uh, for me. But there's enough inner Bollywood in me to still want to see Indian cinema and cherish it. And particularly when I'm back in New York then, and you're missing India, uh, it's a great way to feel connected uh, back home. You know, I read that piece. You wrote that piece right after the Oscars, of course. And, um, and I think you, made, you raised a very important question that I think a lot of us have been asking for a, for a while now. Why, don't, why doesn't India make world-class films? And I think what you did also was, you know, you, you sort of played the devil's advocate. You also presented the, um, the answers and the excuses, I'd like to call them, that are frequently made. You know, do we need, why do we need to woo the West when we have such a large Indian audience residing all over the world? Um, you know, the, 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 the committee that selects the films are, are it, you know, doesn't know how to do their job very well. Uh, the Oscars are, are biased. I mean, every, every possible answer and excuse that we've heard over the years. But, you know, as someone who has, in fact, closely watched foreign films and, you know, uh, and, and tracked that, what, what sort of answer comes back to you? I mean, what do you think is the answer to that question? Why do you think um, that we haven't, in fact, been able to, uh, you know, to, to, to put ourselves on the map in the way that certainly European cinema has, the French films have, the Spanish films have, and now Asian cinema has, you know, with, with Parasite, you're, you know, a, a different part of the world was in the spotlight. Um, you know, a, a film from Korea went and took that biggest honor. What, you know, have you been able to sort of, you know, contemplate that question? Yeah, so first I think that we need to bust this myth that there is a big difference between critical success and commercial success. I think that's French, Korean cinema has shown, mm. even Argentine cinema has shown, that it's quite possible to have both commercial and critical success. Parasite was a massive box office hit in uh, South Korea first, and then it went on to win this incredible international acclaim. We've seen that often with French cinema as well, Italian cinema as well. So I think that that is something which we just need to be honest with ourselves. Now, regarding why in India we have not been able to produce this kind of cinema, which appeals to a global audience, and we are very happy with cinema that just appeals to the Indian diaspora w worldwide. I think the biggest problem that I can sort of sense here is the incredible star culture we have out here, which is that if you look at our movie budgets, the amount of money that goes towards paying stars is extremely high. You, I don't think there's any other country in the world where you have top stars who negotiate to take 80 to 90 percent of the revenues or some crazy number of that of the total uh, you know, film's budget. Uh, I think that that is unprecedented in uh, other parts of the world. So, I, you know, like there's a uh, very well-known film critic who put it to me once, in fact, that India does not produce actors, it produces stars. So I think that really is, I think, a big problem for us, that the star culture is extremely big out here, that, uh, and then the amount of money and resources left to focus on things like script or even uh, very good production values, uh, or even to pay the directors well, I think that money is quite limited. So the star culture is possibly the single biggest fault line um, as to why we have not been able to, I think, produce better cinema. So you know, we have had this incredible uh, period also where we have had superstars out here, uh, but the amount of money that they suck in uh, is uh, inordinately large, much larger than any other film industry in the world, including Hollywood. Right. You know, I think you make a very valid point, um, but I also think that that is very slowly um, changing. And I think that the OTT space, and I think that you know, great shows which are driven by story and character, and and you know, great writing and great direction, um, and real actors in those parts. I think that that will, you know, it's already slowly changing the landscape. And hopefully, you know, like you rightly say, um, hopefully that will that will eventually go on to change the film landscape as well. But Richard, I, I, we only have time for one more question, and I have to ask you. you 
you know, while you've been quarantining here in New Delhi uh, for the last few months away from your home in um, New York, what have been some of the things that you've watched? There could be uh, foreign films, there could be Indian films, there could be shows that are streaming. Um, what have you watched that has blown your mind? Give us a little, uh, you know, a watch list, like the top five recommendations, if you like. Right. So, Rajiv, I think that um, I've always been a bit reluctant to immerse myself in some of these uh, serials just because it's such a time suck. But I've been very happy that I've been able to see some of these sure. serials uh, in this period. I've been very impressed with Patal Lok. I think that it was a cut above the rest in terms of the other kind of uh, OTT, uh, you know, like shows that we have uh, seen. I think it was quite authentic. I think that trend started with Sacred Games and we have you know, gotten better stuff after that, including um, uh, Mirzapur and possibly even Family Man. But I think that Patal Lok takes it to a new level. So I was very impressed to see that. I thought that even something like Aria, which has just started to stream, I've uh, just been seeing that. Even that I found pretty gripping, although it sort of has the usual Indian melodra uh, melodramatic flourishes to it, but I think that that is also there. So those are a couple of things that I've been uh, like personally very impressed with, and I think there's a lot of good buzz about those uh, serials. I've also tried to keep up with uh, some of the foreign movies that I can't see uh, back in New York. I saw this incredible Korean movie called The Man Standing Next, um, which is about the assassination of this very controversial Korean president uh, back in the late 1970s. Right. Again. What's really good about this foreign cinema is that it takes, it transports you back to a different uh, uh, era, and it's a very good lesson in history. In a similar vein, I saw a series called, uh, uh, right. a movie called The Colony Case, uh, which was about, again, about a very famous, uh, you know, sort of German book uh, that's been uh, transported to the screen, but dealing with a very unique period of German history and the trial of uh, ex-Nazis. So that I also found extremely good. And again, talking about authenticity, I saw this cricket uh, uh, series on Amazon Prime called The Test, where, you know, where I, and I hope that the BCCI one day will allow something like that, where they actually uh, had cameras in the dressing room capturing how the Australian team tried to revive right. itself over a very difficult spell. And to see such dressing room action live um, was quite fascinating for me. So you asked for the top five, I'd say that two movies, one kind of a docudrama, right. and two uh, uh, Indian series, Patal Lok and uh, Arya, would be the five things that have kept me entertained during this period. Now, I've watched two out of those five, which is, which is not great for a film critic. I'm not interested in cricket, so I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore that one, but I am going to, I am going to check out the, the two foreign films that you mentioned. Thank you, Richard. This was very interesting. Thank you. And you know, uh, you know, you write, you write all these books about emerging markets and the economy. I think there's a film book there somewhere, Richard. I think your perspective would be incredible, uh, to, you know, to, to, to listen to you talk about the movies and how they've changed your life. So, um, we will be waiting for that film book, but thank you so much for this. Um, I, I, I feel like this was, this was very interesting. And for anyone who's wondering what uh, a global investor is doing talking to a film critic, I, I hope that question was answered. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking forward to reading a lot more that you're putting out. Any, any great recommendations, feel, please continue to feel free, uh, free to share. Thank you so much, Richard. Sure, Raj. It's a pleasure to do this with you. Thank you.